Today, I just want to speak to you out of the book of Acts. Acts, uh, if you're turning your Bible to Acts chapter 13, and uh, that's where I'm going to speak to you out of. Our church is uh, what I would call a missions church. Missions and evangelism are two key proponents in every hundred ministries that we have. Our outreach is constantly focused out. How can we bring people to Jesus? I am so glad uh, in the first service we had a representative from Reinhard Bonke, who is coming to Nassau County in November for two nights of evangelism. I praise God for that man. I have seen him at work in Africa, and I know he's a man of God, and signs and wonders always accompany him when he's ministering. So let us be in prayer. If you have an unsaved friend, take him to a good evangelism service like that. Also, if you have a, a friend who's sick, I'm telling you, God confirms the message that Bonke preaches with signs following. And it would be a good chance for you to have a, a witness to your neighbors. Well, in Acts chapter 13, uh, we have a story of a church called in the city of Antioch. On the map up there on the screen, you can see where Antioch is. Circled by red. Look down south is Palestine and Jerusalem. You see that? It's about 300 miles to the north. It's called Antioch of Syria. So that when the church had been scattered out of Jerusalem, people went up into Antioch of Syria, preached the gospel, and a large group of people heard the gospel. The church was under really heavy, heavy persecution. Herod was the king over the area, and uh, this man was a wicked man. He received worship and praise uh, for his own life, and uh, so uh, religiously, and politically, the whole area was under strong, evil influence. So in Acts chapter 13, and I'm going to read this portion of scripture. I'm going to read it out of the Bible I use, which is the New American Standard Bible. But in your pew, if you want to open the Bible to Acts 13, follow along with me. And let's just see how this story develops and the truths that we can gain from it as a church with regard to emissions and evangelism. So I want to start in uh, Acts chapter 12, just to give you the history. In Acts chapter 12, verse 1, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. It pleased everybody. So in verse 5, he, kept, he grabbed hold of Peter and put Peter in prison, probably with the intent of killing him also. So there was a mighty deliverance of Peter from prison, and uh, God, the angel of the Lord delivered him. In uh, verse 18 of chapter 12, uh, the Herod searched for Peter, could not find him. And then uh, in verse 22 of chapter 12, the people took Herod and called him a god and not a man and began worshiping him. And he was so proud of it, stood in front of everybody that God himself judged Herod right on the spot. And the Bible says immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory, uh, did not give, give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and he died. Wow. There's nothing worse than being eaten by worms before you die. I mean, that's a double shot, isn't it? Before and after. This is something. What a way to go. Verse 24, it says, The word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem where they had fulfilled their mission. So right in the middle of all this political stuff, persecution, the Bible says the word of God grew and multiplied. Wow. I just wanted to stop and think about that in, in the situations that we live now. Do you know in Iraq, what used to have 3 million Christians, now there are only 300,000 Christians left in Iraq because the people are either being martyred for Jesus or they have to flee the country. It's, it's something, the, the way that things are happening there politically. In North Korea, we all are aware of the terrible persecution of Christians in North Korea. Uh, in other places of the world. I'll be showing you a couple of pictures. So in spite of all that, the Bible says the word of the Lord grew and multiplied. Chapter 13. Now there were at Antioch in the church that was there prophets and teachers, 
Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Uh, when I was in Africa, uh, there was a movement among the communist people to turn people, uh, the Africans, away from the gospel of Jesus, citing that the Christianity was a Western religion. And this chapter 13 was a great blessing to Africans because several of those people, there was Simeon, who was called Niger, Niger means black, and Lucius of Cyrene, which is in northern Africa. So they great, got great comfort and strength from the fact that the early church was established long, long before the Western church was established over here. It was established in Africa. And so the Africans just really grabbed this chapter. It was really neat. In verse 2, it says, While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Who is they? And who is them? It says, they sent them away. Who they sent? Who, who's they? That's, a, that's an answerable question. The church. The leaders of the church. The church. The church in Antioch sent them. Who's them? Barnabas and Saul. Here he's called Saul. That would be his Jewish name. Paul would be his Roman name. All right? So they sent away. Now look at verse 4. Look at verse 4 carefully. I love it. So being sent out by the church. Does it say church? Sent out by the Holy Spirit. Don't you see that? I love it, guys. This is the hand-in-hand -hand movement of the church along with the Holy Spirit. A missionary should not be sent out if the church isn't backing him, if he hasn't proved his ministry in the church. So the church knows him. And he should never be sent out if he has never been called by the Holy Spirit. they got to be together. The church and the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's why I love what is happening here in our church. As on uh, Saturday morning, Catch the Vision was held here. And there, there was a good group of people in Catch the Vision. And as I walked into just the Greek people in Catch the Vision, I asked, how many of you are sensing the call of God in your life in missions and evangelism? Oh, my. The response was wonderful and beautiful. And I said to myself as I was leaving, how wonderful it is to see in place here the call of God in the lives of people and the catch the vision where people are coming to be members and have responsibility and opportunity and accountability right here at Smithtown Gospel Tabernacle. This is what we want. This is what happened. Remember, the book of Acts is not just historical, folks. The book of Acts is, is a manual. This is how God wants missions to be done. Some people relegate Acts. Their philosophy is there's a period at the book of Acts. What happened way back then happened and finished. A Pentecostal person says the book of Acts is our manual. Our philosophy is the book of Acts is keeping chapters added in our lives. I'm going to read a letter to you from uh, Nigeria in a little while. You just will rejoice because it sounds like Luke writing the book of Acts. What God is doing right now. I love it. So Acts is our manual. So this is really great for us. All right. So verse 4. They being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. And from there they sailed to Cyprus. I just want to say this about Cyprus. Cyprus was the home island of Barnabas. So the first stop they're making on this first missionary trip, sent out from a local church, Antioch. The first stop they make is in Cyprus. Look on Cyprus on the map up there. That's his hometown. So he goes into Cyprus, and I just love it. Here, listen. Missionary work starts right where you are. Don't come and say, oh, I want to be an evangelist in Africa, and you're not an evangelist here in America. People need salvation on the way to the airport as you're going to the airport, equally as where you go over there. Don't fly over people who need Jesus. <laughs> the light that shines farthest 
shines brightest close by. And so I just want to encourage you. All of us are evangelists. All of us are missionaries. Now some pick up and go. I like to say that's the difference between capital M missionary and small m missionary. Capital E evangelist. That, you know, there are people in our church who are evangelists that win more souls to Jesus in a week than I will in a year. That's the, that's the nature of them. You know what I'm saying? But that doesn't mean all, the rest of us don't evangelize. Paul told Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. You say, well, I, I'm not an evangelist. Okay. Just do their work then. That's all. You're not a missionary. You say, oh, I'm not, I've never been to Africa. That's capital M, missionary. You're a small M, missionary. You also are sent to reach people to Jesus. I love it when we have guests here in our church. I want to see who they are. Who brought them here to church? All of us ought to be bringing people to the church. Hear the gospel of Jesus. So anyway, that's it. Now, it says, verse 5, they went to Salamis. They became, in verse 5, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John as their helper. The name John, you would mostly would be aware of it. It's John Mark. That's the fellow who wrote the gospel of Mark. He was also Barnabas's relative. So Barnabas said to his cousin or nephew or whichever, hey, come on, let's go on a missionary trip. Yeah, let's go. And so John just jumped on board and joined Paul and Barnabas. There were probably other guys that went with them also. Okay, verse 6. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet, whose name was Bar-Jesus. Unique thing. The word Bar means son of. So this guy, you know, he's really, he's really, Spanish says apellido. His really last name is uh, uh, Elimas Bar-Jesus. Elimas, the son of Jesus. Now, I'll mention that in a minute. This Bar thing is not too unique. Remember when Jesus was going to die on the cross, they released that other guy named Bar Abbas. Remember Bar Abbas? The word Abbas means father, so the Bar Abbas would mean son of the father. Was that guy really a son of our Heavenly Father? No, Bar Abbas wasn't. This guy calls himself Bar Jesus. In a minute, let's listen to what Paul says. This guy named, this, this false prophet who was with the proconsul, verse 7, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for thus his name is translated, was opposing them. Notice the tense of the grammar there, was opposing them. Not just that he opposed them, but he was opposing them. So it was an ongoing thing. It was a constant thing. And he sought to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him. Huh. This is amazing. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Fixed his gaze on him. Fixed his gaze on him. Do you ever see somebody when they look at you? It looks like they're just looking right into your soul. Do you ever see that? I say that about Billy Graham. I think when I look at Billy Graham sometimes, his eyes are like steel or something. And when he looks at me, oh, it just looks like he's looking way inside me. Uh, Paul fixed his gaze on him and he said, You who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil. <laughs> now the guy called himself what? Bar Jesus, son of Jesus. But Paul said, You're no son of Jesus, you're the son of the devil. Isn't that interesting? So are we brothers with everybody? I'm not. There's people that are called children of the devil. They're not our brothers and sisters. They've got a different father than I got. So, so anyway, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? And now, behold, look now, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and not see for see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him, 
And he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. That's awesome. That's awesome. In Africa, we had an old missionary. If some of the old people at the church might know him, his name was Clifford Johnson. When I went to Africa in 70, he was in his 70s. So he was an older, older brother. But he lived on a mission station way back in the jungle, way away from uh, any contact. And uh, they, rose, they raised up a big church there. They had an orphanage. They had a high school, junior high school. So it was really a neat work that Clifford had raised up. And a lot of people have come to know Jesus, so they would come to church. And among the people who was a Christian was a man who was a mighty hunter among them. This guy would go out and kill meat in the jungle so that the whole village would have something to eat. And every day this guy would go out. He would bring back anything from what, we, what you would call like a groundhog. Uh, the Africans would call it ground beef. That was a little bit different than the ground beef I'm used to, but that was because it ran on the ground, I think. And he could get ground beef, and he could kill elephant. One time we had a conference there, and there were hundreds of people, and this man went out, and there was a rogue elephant, and they killed an elephant. So he was a mighty hunter. And uh, he had been a, a leader in the church, but he took to himself a second and a third wife, which is a no-no in the Christian circles. And uh, so because of that, he was disciplined and told that he could not be a leader in the church because he had taken his third wife. Well, on the Sunday that they announced that, he stood up in church, turned around to everybody and laughed at them and mocked them and said, who are you people? You are nobody. I don't care if I am put out of this church or not. Some, I know, you know, he just went on. He was angry and he went on and on. An old man, Clifford Johnson, missionary, the Spirit of the Lord came on him. He stood up in the middle and he called that man by name. And he said, I tell you by the power of the Lord from this day on, you will not kill another meat. That's a bold statement for the best hunter in the, in the village. The man laughed at Clifford Johnson. This is a missionary. He mocked him right in front of everybody. I will show you, he said. He went, got his weapons and went out to kill meat. The man tried for one solid year and did not bring so much as a ground beef back to the village for a whole year. This man who was opposing the gospel, after a year they were having a big meeting in the church and he came into the middle and fell down on his knees in front of everybody. He said, please forgive me. Take the curse off my life. Please, I'm sorry. We have fixed it now. I'm only with one wife at this time. So please take the curse off my life. So the, the elders in the church and the missionaries said, no, we haven't brought a curse on you. It's your own disobedience that brought the curse upon your own head. So if you have repented, God will bless you and he will help you. And sure enough, the guy went out of that meeting and killed the first animal that he had in a solid year. This is so wonderful just to see that not only is the book of Acts something historical, this, what I'm telling you happened during my lifetime in Africa. God honors his word. Elijah stood on a mountain, don't you remember? They, people were in rebellion. The king was against God and Elijah said, it will not rain. And God honored that rain. Then another time he says, it will rain. And God honored that word. And I like it. I, I, I wish, I like it for boldness to be upon all of us as we are carrying out the word of God. Authority of Jesus. Jesus said, I have all authority in heaven and earth. You go now, you. And he's given us the power of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever wanted to just lay hands on somebody and see them healed? Huh? Have you ever wanted to? How about doing it sometimes? Just boldly go to somebody. I say, oh, yeah, I see you're sick. Let me pray for you. Jesus, you are the great healer. And in boldness, you'll see God will honor his word. So this is the story we're reading. All right. The son of the devil. Even the 
It sounds good to say sometimes, doesn't it? Don't you guys wish you could say it to somebody? Somebody? Your boss or somebody? You son of the devil. Verse 12. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. Now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos, came to Perga and Pamphylia. John left them and returned to Jerusalem. I can't deal with that here. John started out well, and the word left there means to leave in a lurch. It means to, de to leave the soldiers for, with whom you are in the army. Desert. That's the word here. He left them. And to study that and find out what happened later on in his life is good. Remember, this is John Mark who wrote Mark's gospel. This is the same guy. So he really had a nice meeting with the Lord. All right. Now I really want to jump down to uh, verse 42 because in, in the next verses, Paul preaches to them. Uh, in, the, in this chapter 13, if, if you're going to study this at home, study the men who are involved in this message, uh, in this chapter. Study the message, which I'm skipping over now, in this chapter. And then study the method of how missionary work was carried out. So, in chapter 13, verse 42, Paul and Barnabas were going out. The people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. Now when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and of the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them were urging them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, since you repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For thus the Lord has commanded us. I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles that you should bring salvation to the end of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread through the whole region. See that? I like it. The word of the Lord was going out. The word of the Lord was going out. And verse 50, the Jews aroused the devout women of prominence and the leading men of the city and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust of their feet in protest against them and went to a town called Iconium. And the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. All right. So this is a wonderful chapter. Remember, this is a chapter that gives us guidelines as a missions church. And if anybody here has the call of God in your life with regard to missions, these are principles that you need to grab a hold of. Like that principle I said, where the local church and the Holy Spirit are just working together. This is so vital, so important. Anyway, there are three things that I, I would like to uh, show you in this Acts of the uh, uh, Missions. Uh, there's a little, they, these men and women were spiritually exercised. They were sincerely engaged and they were very sensitive to the Holy Spirit. But I really want to talk to you about some other areas. The first area I want to talk to you about has to do with the demands of missionary work, the difficulties of missionary work. In the demands of missionary work, I want you to see that they were not lazy guys that they chose to do missionary work. These people were hardworking. Barnabas and Saul, and Saul were already engaged in the local church ministry. When young people, when people come to me and they say, oh, Pastor Rich, I'd like to be a missionary. What, what, can, what can I do? I, I feel that maybe that's what I need to do. My first, first, first question is, where are you engaged in the local church? Where? What are you doing in ministry here? Under whose guidance are you uh, ministering? Who's your pastor that oversees? Who are the leaders that are helping you? How are you developing that? Because the local church is the seabed of our missionaries. And local church, listen to me. This is a great opportunity for all of us. Do you know, to the extent that we help these young people as a body, 
We help them. They come to us. They say, I want to go to Guyana. Can you help me? I become their prayer partner. The, to that extent that we help them, we are developing evangelists and missionaries for the work of God. It's not for nothing. This is not a lark. This is a true endeavor to see the work of God go out. So there was the best talent that was here. There was a divine call. There was true consecration. But the second thing, you can see already the difficulties of missionary work. You all know Tory Rasmussen. Did you read his newsletter not too long ago where he was talking about that with a, a team? They were walking on the trails in Tanzania, Africa, headed for a village. And they just sensed that they were being followed. And when they checked on it really deeply, they were being followed by a pride of lions. Pride of Lions was stalking them. Uh, a time later, I don't know how much time later, we got another letter from Tori said that while they were doing the work, a Tanzanian man came through their camp, greeted everybody, went on past their camp, and the next day they found the body of that man who was partially eaten by lions. So when we talk about the demands of uh, Missionary, we also have to look at the dangers. In the story here of the Bible, in Acts 13, it says they went from the mainland over to Cyprus. Well, there were pirates in that time, in those days. There were wild animals that Paul and uh, Barnabas faced. Paul said that many times I did it. There were lawless people all around. And uh, one of our missionaries, was this home was broken into. Not once, not twice, not three times, five times by lawless people breaking in and stealing out of their home. Well, these are the difficulties, the dangers that our missionaries face when they are gone. In some of the countries, the work, the work of, is, of Islamics are, is so difficult, our missionaries don't have freedom, and they cannot speak the word of God openly. How we need to pray for them. And that's why I said pray for Brother uh, Michael, Pray for Eric and Cindy Black. Pray for our missionaries in Malaysia. All these missionaries are faced with great, great difficulties. In uh, Cyprus, the goddess of the island was Venus. She's called the, the goddess of love. And, and accompanying the worship of Venus was so much immorality and licentiousness. And in the world today, boy, where you go in third world countries, it is so difficult when I'm raised, when you're raised in a Christian home, areas of immorality are pretty defined by us. Well, I found in Africa, some of the places that we would go, people weren't aware whether a thing was moral or immoral. This was just part of life. And so a term is used, the word amoral. Amoral means uh, there's no morality in this issue. Well, there was great things to overcome. There's a church in China. Uh, it's a three $3 million church. They have uh, hundreds of people who attend this church. And because of the rise in persecution now, they have sent bulldozers into this church to bulldoze this church down. And I was reading the other day, uh, you can search this on Google, that the Christians gathered, gathered, and just tried to stop them from bulldozing this beautiful building. But because of the persecution in China, uh, this building was destroyed. This is only an example of many, many places in the world. So the difficulties of missionary work we see in this passage that we are, re are reading. But I don't want to close on the difficulties. I have been a missionary. I spent 35 years in Africa. And I want to say, when I look back on Africa, I don't look back at difficulties. I don't. My children have suffered with sickness. Cerebral malaria. I thought my child was going to die. I have been with Dr. Mark and Jody Gilzon, their beautiful 19-year-old daughter, preaching in a village that doesn't know Jesus, was bit by a mosquito that went, and the malaria went straight to her head, and they were so close to losing. All those difficulties are there. But my goodness, wherever you preach the gospel, you're going to have difficulties. People are going to mock at you. People are going to laugh at you. People are going to oppose you. So I don't want to dwell on that. It happened to Jesus. Guess what? As it happened to the master, it's going to happen to us. So buckle up. Get ready. It's going to happen. And don't run from it. If you run from it, 
You're going to just chase your own self in circles. That's all. Be bold. Be strong. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. But the delights of this missionary work is really wonderful. Can you imagine the feeling that a person has when you go to a place that God has called you and you just sense, oh, God has led me to this place. When I was a young Bible college student, I told my bride-to-be, Esther, uh, I am going to be a missionary in uh, a Latin country. My mom and dad were missionaries in Mexico. I grew up on the streets of Mexico in the state of Michoacan. So I know Spanish. So I just figured, okay, let me go to a Spanish country. But on the last days of our uh, days in Bible college, just prior to getting married, I had a special dream that was not an ordinary dream. I'm not given to dreams, but this one I knew was a special dream. And in the dream, I dreamed that I had a, a, my, a daughter, my daughter on my back. I had no kids then. My daughter on my back. I had a daughter holding onto my pant pocket in my dream. And I was going into a valley and on the other side of the valley were huts, but they were African huts. They were not Latin America huts. I woke up, and when I met Esther again, I said to Esther, you know, I had this funny dream. Honey, would it bother you if rather than going to Latin America, if we ended up in Africa? And at that time, I, I had no leading in it. And she said, Rich, wherever God leads us, we'll go. All right. So I've had 15 years. Now I'm in Africa. I have two daughters. And we do what we call village evangelism. Esther and I and the two girls would take a month and go visit village after village after village preaching the gospel of Jesus. And here I was walking in the village and all of a sudden I found myself with my daughter on my shoulder, my other kid holding on to my pants because we were walking hours walking down into a valley a river there and on the other side I saw huts African huts and I turned to Esther Esther I said I'm having a like a deja vu thing <laughs> it's like I've been here this is what I saw long time ago when I asked you if you would go with me to Africa now did that change anything for me no that I Stop right there and go back home or what? No, no, no. But what that gave me was an incredible assurance and joy that where I was was where God wanted me at that time. That was such a blessing. That was such a blessing. It was such a blessing. And I want to tell you, as you fulfill God's call in your life, as you listen to him, time issues are not issues. It's obedience to his call. And you may have had a call when you were a young person, got married, raised your family, and now you're in your 60s or 70s or whatever. Let me tell you, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. The call of God is still on you. Things are changed now. Now it's time to make your adjustments. I'll tell you, a retired person can do much better with the income that they're getting than some of our own missionaries get. Go. You can do it. These young people need People to assist them, older people to stabilize them, encouraging them in the Lord. Some of these guys just came back from Idaho. Look at the team that you had. Older people in their 70s, young people in their teens. Oh, glorious time in Idaho. Don't you hear what I'm saying? The delights of mission, knowing that you are fulfilling God's call in your life is the greatest thrill that you will have in your life. You'll have grand, grand opportunities. During our missions conference, we had a young couple here. Their name was Mark and Jody Gilzon. They had, their, they had their display just out this door here, if you saw it. They're missionaries in Tanzania. I'm saying grand opportunities. You know what Mark does? Mark treats over 10,000 people a year in the middle of the jungle in Tanzania, in the middle of the plains in Tanzania. What an opportunity. What a wonderful chance of serving God. And his children, two of them are coming home to college. What's their desire? They want to go back and serve the Lord because it's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. It's marvelous. Listen, there's another thing that is so delightful. You know what it is? To be anointed by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to tell you something that's a secret. And normally missionaries never tell people because then they, people don't feel sorry for them. 
There is more anointing and blessing and joy serving the Lord in Africa than there is in my own home country. It's a mystery. Listen, listen to this letter. I just got July 26th. What's the date today? 27th? Uh, he says, hi, Pastor Rich and Grace. That's his wife here. We had a great time walking around the village of San Sane and inviting people to the outreach. They played a movie and did worship. Many made first-time decisions for the Lord. I estimate 15 to 30 people. Cool. When does that ever happen around here? Uh, 50 to 70 people made re recommitments to the Lord. 50 to 70 people made recommitments to the Lord. <laughs> Jesus said, a prophet has no honor in his own country. That's a missionary statement. You don't have honor here. Get up out of here and go where there is honor. <laughs> Listen to what this man says. Uh, let's see. Those at the altar were really honest, humble, and transparent. They were repenting of specific stuff. They... God's anointing was really honest. He says that twice in this letter. God's anointing was really honest. They went to a village with 700 to 900 students preaching the gospel. 700 to 900 students gave their life to Jesus. And in the, he says, and God's anointing was honest. Huh. The delights of missionary. You see in the story... In chapter, chapter 13, verse 52, look at the, the closing verse there. It says, And the disciples were continually filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. Continually. It was a continual thing. There is great blessings in obeying, fulfilling the call in your life in the area of missions. So I just want to conclude with that. Joy, delights. The demands are there. God, you've got to have a call of God. You need to be locked into a local church. That's, that's there. There are dangers on this road. It is true. It's true. But you got them in New York too. You got this stupid mosquito that gives you the disease here. Everybody's afraid of malaria. Well, Long Island's got this other one. What do you call it? Yeah. And Lyme's disease and all. Let me go to Africa. <laughs> it's safe over there. So listen, my, my altar call today is for you who are sensing, you are just growing in the call of God in the area of missions and evangelism. And you're hearing the Holy Spirit just tug at you. I'm, I want you. I want you to engage more. I want you to dedicate yourself more to this. And if you want that in your life. You say, I hear the call of God. I don't know where it's going to take me. I don't know how long. So those aren't the issues now. It's just your obedience, your willingness to say to God, here am I. I'll do it. Then I'm going to invite you to the front. And I want you to come to this side over here. And some pastors and some missions uh, people will be here. And over here on the, this side, I want the people who are altar workers, if you are here today and you need special prayer, you're sick and you need prayer. I want you to be here. But specifically for those guys who are sensing God's call. Now here, I want to address this in two ways. I want you to affirm it. You know this is what God wants you to do. So that's your time to come up forward. See, there's something that happens when you do that. And you just engage your will and your feet. I'll do it. Some of you now have sensed God's call on your life since you were a kid. And because of life, you've moved away for it. As an older person, the worst thing you can do is just say, okay, my life is over, I'm retiring. Your retirement isn't until you go to heaven. That's God's retirement plan. Die, go to heaven. <laughs> but God never said quit while you're here. He never said it. And go into all the world is not a, an age thing. We can do it. 70-year-old missionaries I have met. So you can do it. You can do it. So some of you now can remember. Oh, yeah, I remember. God laid his hand on my life. I want you, again, just to 
affirm that before God. Say, God, I'm hearing this again. I don't know where it'll take me. I don't know what I'll do. But I'm hearing your voice. And I want you to come up on this side. And I want you to put your name on a card and give me your name and email so that we can get in touch and we can talk about that. So do you hear how we're going to end our service? I'd like everybody to stand. Everybody to stand. Hear the voice of the Lord. Who will go for me? Whom shall I send? God wants to hear your voice. Hear my Lord, send me. So I'm opening this side of the altar up. Pastor Scott, will you lead us in a song of invitation? I'm opening this side up. I want some pastors, if you're in here, or elders of the church, deacons, I want you to come and move into this place and pray. That's good. Others of you who are ordained in ministry, come on. Join. Join over here. That's it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen to the voice of the Lord. Older folk, no retirement. Re-engage. Hallelujah. That's right. Just begin praying. Pray with these people. Here. Just begin praying. Why are you here? How can we pray for you? That's right. Oh, I surrender all. If you need prayer, if you're sick, if you want somebody to agree with you in prayer, come. You're welcome. Come, come. Come and pray. Pray for your families. Pray for whatever is on your heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's right. Pray. Pray together. Lord, here am I. Here am I. Send me. Not too young, not too old. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Come in, please. Come in. Come, come forward. Come forward. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Out of this church, raise up workers, Lord. Raise up people who are sending. Raise up people who are giving. Oh, oh God. Let's not be lazy. Let us be engaged. The work of ministry. The work of missions. And the work of evangelism. That's right. We hear you, Lord. Father, we hear what you are saying. We hear you. We hear you. We say yes. We say yes. We will do what you want us to do between you and the Lord. It's not between you and me. Lord, I hear you. I hear you. As a church, Lord, we will send. Is that true, church? We will send. We will help these young people, these older people, find ways to get to the mission field. Oh, God. Move us out of retirement into engagement. Hallelujah. Thank you. Move forward here just a little bit so people can come in. Move forward. Move forward. Hallelujah. Oh, it's right. not a small thing, Lord. I trust you who work. It's not a small thing. I trust you. I trust you who do the work, Lord. In Jesus' name. Okay. To thee, my blessed Savior. Father, I just bless you first of all. You answer prayer. When, you, when we ask you, raise up workers, you are doing it. I thank you. Holy Spirit, you are the Lord of the harvest. You are the one who is speaking into lives. And I pray that the call of God would be so overwhelming in these lives that they will not be able to turn away from what you are directing them. Lead and guide, show, direct. Oh, Father, just have your hand upon their lives. For these folk on this side, Lord, who are praying for different needs. Oh, as a church, we pray you will give them their heart's cry. Bless them and strengthen them. And for our whole body, Lord, I just pray your blessing on them. I thank you, Lord, for Smithtown Gospel Tabernacle. And the call that you have given us as a church. A call that reaches out to people who need Jesus Christ. So thank you, and I bless them all in the name of Jesus. Amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah.